All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Barbells and Burgers podcast. I got a very special guest, Dr. Jade Tita. How's it going, Jade? Good to see you, Shane. Thanks for having me, brother. It's going good, actually. Absolutely. Crazy cool. times, crazy times, but I'm still doing well. I know we're all kind of struggling right now during this, like we're recording this during this COVID thing. So it's a little nuts, but can't, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm an introvert, so I'm weathering it well. I'm the same way. I'm actually pretty enjoying it a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think probably the best place to start, because I'm not sure how familiar my audience is with you and your background, is to kind of give a brief background on yourself and why you gravitated towards uh, a specialty in natural medicine mm. and hormones and metabolism. Yeah, you know, um, most people, when they ask me this, I tell them that I started doing this at 15 years old, and they kind of raise an eyebrow, and they're kind of like, well, what do you mean? And what I mean by that is that uh, I got into fitness really early, had two older brothers, and um, was really into athletics, and, you know, one of these kids that was coming up and had dreams of playing in the NFL and all this kind of stuff, and so at 15 years old, I was already heavily into reading magazines on fitness and writing programs for myself and, you know, training pretty hard. And that turned into writing programs for a lot of my teammates. And then that turned into writing programs for their, you know, sort of mothers and fathers. And so I literally started writing fitness programs at 15 years old. And that course brought me into a love of nutrition, because obviously, if you're going to get into fitness and athletics, you start wondering about how do I fuel my body? So by the time I graduated high school, I was very much into fitness and nutrition already and decided to study biochemistry in undergrad because of that, because I was sort of in my mind being like, well, how do I understand like what the body is doing with fuel? So I went into biochemistry with a plan to go into medicine, uh, conventional medicine, sort of uh, later and also made my way through personal training all through undergrad. I personal trained and bartended all through undergrad. So this gives you a sense of my sort of background in health and fitness and psychology, which is basically what I've studied my whole life, these two things. So the bar was very much psychology driven. And then of course I was in, in the gym and then studying biochemistry outside of that. When I got into your question about natural medicine, um, I had been doing lifestyle medicine from my point of view all through undergrad, you know, uh, nutrition, coaching, and personal training. And so by the time I went to go to medical school, um, I was literally shocked, man, because to be honest with you, I, I didn't really, really realize that they don't train you in diet and exercise in a conventional medical school. And I don't know what was wrong with me at the time, because I, I just assumed that they did. And when I started looking at the curriculum, I kind of, I was just like, oh my God, I'm not going to go into medicine. Because while I have nothing against conventional medicine, I mean, I think it saves lives and it's wonderful. That's not the kind of medicine that I wanted to practice. I wanted to keep doing what I was doing. So I kind of went through um, a brief moment of sort of shock and recalibration. And then I discovered a school uh, called Bastyr University, which was one of four schools in the country at the time that trained primary uh, physicians in natural medicine. Now at this time, Shane, this was uh, in 1998, right? And so back then that was considered witchcraft medicine. Like right now, it, I had no idea then that functional medicine and complementary and alternative medicine would be so huge and be so much in the mainstream back then. So it was a big leap of faith of me just basically going, hey, this is what I'm gonna do. I don't care what anyone thinks and I'm going in this direction because I wanna do lifestyle medicine. Turned out that became a huge interest for everyone. But my story went on a little bit from there because once I got out of school, I practiced in a consulting clinic for a while and I was like, you know, I really want to merge fitness and natural medicine and psychology all in one. So I went online and began writing books, wrote a best-selling book back in 2010. And that kind of launched sort of my education in this realm. And I've been loving it sort of ever since. So to make it simple for everyone listening, take a personal trainer, 25 years experience, take a natural medicine physician with 12 years of experience sort of in the natural, natural medicine world, and then take a psychology geek who's taken every health coaching certification probably since the 1990s all the way up to present. You know, I've had just tons of them. And I'm a philosophy, you know, sort of geek as well. And so I like to say my specialty is mind, muscle, and metabolism. I basically teach in all those realms. Yeah, that's something that I found so interesting about you when I first discovered, uh, you know, what you, because when I first found out about you, it was a T Nation article. And I was like, this guy's different than a lot of the other, you know, article or authors I've, I've read about on T Nation. And I was really interested in your background and how you had a, a much more, I don't know if holistic's the right word, but a lot more, a lot more uh, 
I guess a deeper background is a good way of putting it than just your typical personal trainer or, uh, you know, nutrition coach or, you know, a dietitian or something to that extent. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's, that's awesome that you've, yeah, you know, one thing I'll say about that Shane too, and I appreciate you saying that because one thing I get asked about a lot is people are, are say like, how do you get this kind of eclectic holistic background? And really what it came from is, um, early on, uh, my father kind of told me, he's like, you know, do what you love and, and chase, chase your passions and turn that into purpose. And that's kind of what I did. So I really did just kind of blaze my own trail and it worked, it, it worked out for me. So I love what I do. And it also, I get that comment that you're making a lot about people being like, you know, you, you have this wide range of sort of expertise. And I think that's not usually the case because we're usually like told to just focus on one lane. And I essentially studied my whole life in three lanes. And so it's, it's worked out in terms of at least I love what I do. And it is interesting that people are interested in talking to me in all these areas now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm curious, we, I kind of designed this podcast around hormones and metabolism because I get questions all the time. Like, how do my hormones affect fat loss and fat gain? Um, and I, I, I would say that probably the most popular question is, do my hormones and how they are regulated or dysregulated supersede energy balance or the calories that I consume in the, in the sense that let's say that I am eating less calories than I burn, but my hormones are just all over the place. Is there a way in which I do like, do I need to fix my hormones first before I can lose fat? You know, if calories are balanced, what, can you clarify that for us? Yeah. Well, the, let me answer it really simply right up front and then I'll start to get into the details. So, do hormones impact fat gain, fat loss, and that kind of thing? Absolutely, 100%, yes. Do they supersede fuel and calories? Absolutely, 100%, no. And here, and here's, so that's the, 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 the simple answer, but let's get into this. And the reason I say absolutely 100% no, they don't supersede calories is because calories impact hormones and hormones impact calories. In other words, this is a false dichotomy that has been created. There is no real difference. When you cut calories down, you adjust hormonal biochemistry. When you bring calories up, you adjust hormonal biochemistry. And so these two things are not opposites. They are synergists. They are essentially working together. And it's sort of this false dichotomy that people create that it's all hormones, which usually means all quality of food and no quantity or calories, or it's all quantity of food and calories and no hormones or quality. And this quality quantity argument is a silly argument in my mind. It is, it is both, and it is extremely important for us to understand that. So let me set everyone up like this and then I'll see where you wanna go, Shane. There are two things, and I'll, I'm gonna choose my phrasing carefully here. There are two things required for sustained fat loss. I use the word sustained and fat loss for a reason because pretty much anyone can lose weight for a brief moment in time. You may not lose fat, you may lose some muscle and some water as well, but if you do a few things, you can lose weight for brief periods of time. But having sustained fat loss is important and there are two things required to do that. One, you must absolutely achieve calorie deficits and you, two, you must absolutely achieve hormonal metabolic balance. Now, when I say, quote, hormonal metabolic balance, what I'm essentially saying there is that you really have to have your hormonal software in your body balanced and not stressed out. And I use the word stressed out is because if you really want an analogy for your metabolism, it's basically a stress barometer. And so when there's too much stress on the system, either from stress like emotional stress or stress like we're going through with COVID right now or stress of eating too much or too little or stress of exercising too much or too little. Anytime you do that, you create a hormonal software program that we can best describe as the starvation response. And what happens is hunger, cravings go up, metabolic rate goes down, and that adjusts the calorie thermostat. And so you can see how you're basically on this pendulum or this seesaw if hormones move, calories move. If calories move, hormones move. There is no separation between the two. So then the question is, and this is the final thing I'll say to see where you wanna go, how, how do we um, manipulate this in a sense? 
when I talk about hormones now, which to me mean all signaling molecules in the body, because if you're going to get, if you're going to speak in biochemistry language, a hormone is really a cholesterol containing molecule that does certain things. But I'm talking about all signaling molecules in the body. If you really want to talk about those, you don't really need to talk about leptin and ghrelin and CCK and GLP and GIP and cortisol and insulin. You don't need to even think about that. You just need to think about what they are impacting. And what they are impacting is hunger and energy and cravings and sleep and mood and exercise performance and exercise recovery and libido and menses and erection and digestion and headaches and joint pains and all of these things. So if you can understand what your physiology is feeling, you understand what your hormones are doing. So now imagine if you just cut calories down, what ends up happening? Well, you start to feel some things, hunger and cravings primarily, which means your hormones change. And so if you're really gonna play this game, what I would say most people need to do is realize that, that anytime you push on the metabolism, you are changing hormones. And if you change them too much in the wrong direction, you're gonna have hunger and cravings go through the roof and you're going to shortchange yourself. It'd be like you're playing on the seesaw, me and Shane on the seesaw together, and he, he jumps off and I go flying and like hit the ground real quick because he jumped off so fast and I do damage, right? That's what a lot of people are doing because they're not understanding that they really need to get these things balanced. Final thing here, how do you get them balanced? I have a funny little acronym that I talk about all the time that uh, people make fun of me for and I become famous for, but it actually will help you remember this. It's called HEC, H-E-C, Hunger, Energy, and Cravings, or SHMEC sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. This is an acronym that I teach people to understand if their hormones are balanced or not. If your HEC, hunger, energy, and cravings, or SHMEC, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings, are in check, then your hormones are balanced. If they're out of check, then you can be sure that your physiology and your hormones are stressed out. And that's absolutely going to impact your calories. And so this is the sort of introduction into this discussion. And I'll let you sort of decide where you want to go from here. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was, that was amazing. Like that was exactly the direction that I, I wanted to go in. And, and I've got tons of questions floating in my head, but I think probably the, the most important thing, I, at least from what I took from that is understanding heck and schmeck and understanding based on those signals, what you need to do next to you know, obviously rebalance your hormones because I it, the way it sounds to me and this is what I've been taught too because I do have a little bit of a holistic background certainly not to the extent that you do but um, you know understanding okay well if I'm you know over like if I'm starving every single day then obviously I'm, I've probably spent too much time in a calorie deficit to the sense that now I'm actually you know messing with my hormones too much so it sounds like it's sort of letting your like letting the signals help determine what you need to do in a balanced way that creates more sustainability so that you can lose body fat over time without, like you said, like the seesaw dropping to these extremes where you have extreme cravings and then you have, or, or, you know, your, your sleep is being dramatically affected. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny, right? Cause people think uh, they have this perception that they can win a, a game of willpower against their physiology and you simply can't, you know, when you're, when you're battling your biochemistry or your physiology or metabolism, it doesn't care about your, timetables, your convenience factors, or your desires. It's going to do what it does. It's almost like being in a tug of war match with a team that is incredibly strong and that you can't beat. And you're, you keep trying to pull them and they just yank you off your feet. The only way you win that game is you let go of the rope. And letting go of the rope is essentially what you just described. It's essentially saying, I'm no longer gonna try to just take a calories only approach. I'm not gonna just try to eat less and exercise more and willpower my way to this. Instead, I'm going to learn the language of the metabolism. And it, it's sort of a pithy phrase, but hopefully you'll remember. And it goes like this. The metabolism doesn't speak English. The metabolism speaks metabolism. And you need to learn to speak that language. And so what happens is once you start to learn what it's telling you, these biofeedback sensations of heck and schmeck, now you have a sense of what direction to go. For example, let's say you know, Shane and I give you a diet to start with. And by the way, you can start with any program, anything you want. I don't care. You like keto? Perfect. You like veganism? Perfect. You like paleo diet? Perfect. You know, you like just a standard American diet? Perfect. Start wherever you want. Now, what's going to happen when you start eating 
and or cutting down calories specifically if you're trying to lose weight what is going to happen is you're going to begin to cause changes in your physiology the body's either going to say i like this and i'm not stressed or i don't like this and i am stressed now if the body likes it and is comfortable and is able to function what it's going to do is it's going to say okay you, you cut down your calories. I'm going to grab my fat stores. I'm going to make up these extra calories and we're all good. And you'll learn, you'll lose some fat. Now, if the body doesn't like it, it's going to say, wait a second, this feels like starvation to me. And so I'm going to try to get that fuel back. I'm going to increase your hunger. I'm going to increase your cravings. I'm going to make sure your energy is unpredictable and unstable. And I'm going to decrease your metabolic rate. Actually, the body does a couple other really insidious, nasty things to you too. Not only does it do slow your resting metabolic rate and cause increased hunger and cravings, it also constrains your metabolism when you go and work out. So that 30 minute workout that you thought you were burning 200 calories, now you're only burning 150 calories. It also insidiously and silently makes it so you're less motivated to get up and walk around so that you fidget less during the day so that you don't move a whole lot in bed. It's basically doing everything it can to recover that energy debt that you have created. And what will happen is this is where the pendulum starts to swing. Now, if you're going to be savvy at this, you need to know when that pendulum starts to swing. So that now, as soon as you start feeling these biofeedback sensations, your hormones talking to you, now you can adjust those calories back up a little bit, or maybe add some protein or some satiating fiber or other things that you and I might teach them about. And now that diet that you started with is paleo plus your individual needs or keto plus your individual needs or veganism plus your individual needs. And by the way, your metabolism doesn't care what your, your nutrition bias is. It only cares that it's getting what it needs. And so rather than letting your bias and your dogma around nutrition determine what you do, you let your metabolism determine what you do. And this is essentially um, sort of what we're talking about. And by the way, it doesn't matter, right? Because there's another false dichotomy we create. And I know you're aware of it, Shane, but I'll share it with everyone here. The other false dichotomy we create is this false dichotomy of, um, hey, we should just be eating intuitively, right? You know, just eat intuitively. You don't have to count anything. And then, no, you need to count and track everything. The truth is that's another false dichotomy. It's, it's also, it's basically the same thing we talked about before. It's basically prioritizing quality over quantity or quantity over quality. And my whole thing is, it doesn't matter where you start. Maybe Shane's a math guy. And he's like, dude, I like to weigh and measure everything and track my calories and my macros. Good for you, Shane. Go at it. Maybe I'm an intuitive person and I would just want to wing it and kind of feel it and be like, well, this, this makes me feel better. That kind of thing. Good, Jade. Do it. But guess what? The proof is in the pudding. So if I'm doing the intuitive approach and not getting results, I'm going to have to move over to the counting and weighing and measuring thing if I want to get results. Likewise, if Shane's over there counting calories and all this and it's acting like a crutch and he never learns to listen to his physiology, he eventually needs to come over to my way of thinking. So all of us are sort of on this journey where we're trying to seamlessly merge these two things. You need to be intuitive enough, but not so intuitive that you don't get results. And you need to be calorie counting and logical and tracking enough, but not so much that it becomes a crutch that you don't know what to do when you're traveling or don't have your, you know, your scale or your Tupperware fixed. And this is the game that we're trying to play. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I think that's such an important message. And I'm glad that you said that because I, I, in my coaching, that's exactly sort of the approach that I take. You know, someone might approach me saying, oh, should I count calories or should I do a more intuitive approach? And I'm like, start with one. Which one do you want to start with? Which one sounds more natural to you? Well, I'm, you know, more type A. I like to have more control. I want to count. Absolutely. Let's do that. But let's not go so far, like you said, and, and make it a crutch to where, you know, like you said, you're in an airport somewhere and you're like, well, I don't know how to track this. Exactly. Now you're relying well, I have no on no idea that. what to eat. I have no idea what's going to satisfy me. I don't know why uh, whatever I ate for breakfast or didn't eat for breakfast made me so hungry for lunch. That's the other thing that people miss, right? They think that meals are independent of one another but they don't realize this whole idea of the second meal effect, which basically means what you eat or don't eat for breakfast directly impacts what you crave to eat, how much you eat and what you will eat for lunch and which directly impacts how much you eat, what you crave to eat for dinner. And so that's how come some of these questions about like, should I do keto or should I do intermittent fasting or all this kind of stuff? I go, well, if you skip breakfast and you get to lunch, does that make you more likely to have 
a large pizza, boo-boo burrito, and a pint of ice cream? Or are you still able to have a sensible, healthy, low-calorie meal? And if you answer, no, it makes me crave and eat all this junk food, then I'm like, then that's not working for you. It's throwing your hormones out of balance. However, if you go through that and you're able to eat sensibly and create a nice calorie deficit at the end of the day and the end of the week, then I say, keep doing that. And again, this goes back to that whole idea of don't let, you, don't let your bias get in the way here. Just because you read a book on intermittent fasting and are all excited about it doesn't mean your metabolism is going to be excited about it. You got to let your metabolism decide instead of letting your sort of wants and desires decide, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's so important to try different things. You know, you'd be, I remember when I first started, it was like, you know, do intermittent fasting. So I try that. But then I realized that, you know, binge eating became a real thing for me because of how hungry I was at lunch. And then subsequently at dinner, like you said, one meal affecting the other. So yeah, that's, that makes a, it's all about customizing it for what works for you. The modality you choose is, is probably going to make certain things easier for certain people, but it could have the exact opposite effect on somebody else. Yeah. And, you know, I get that this, this is one of the things, and I know you get this too, Shane, so we'll, I'll just delve into this a little bit for the listener, because one of the things that pops up, and it should pop up, if you're listening to me and Shane right now, and you're kind of thinking, you know, this, this makes sense, Jade, but what you're saying is just trial and error, right? And, and you alluded to this, and, and we don't like that, right? And in a sense, Shane and I are saying that, but I'm going to give you a way to do this where it doesn't feel so all over the place. It's a concept I call structured flexibility. And it essentially means, and Shane alluded to it, it's like, choose whatever you want to choose. You know, if, if intermittent fasting is the thing that you feel like you want to try, or a keto diet is the thing that you feel like you want to try, then I'm all for it. Start there. And once you start, we all know what's going to happen. At that point, now you need to start reading the paragraphs that the text messages or emails that your metabolism is sending to know is it doing what you need it to do? So you start measuring heck and schmeck. And with something like the keto diet or maybe tracking uh, continuous blood glucose or, or maybe you have an aura ring or some other device that measures other parameters, you can take that more objective data along with your more subjective data. And what you essentially do is you start with this structure and then you go, at the end of the week, am I losing fat? Right, that's number one, yes or no. Is my heck schmeck in check? Number two, if you're losing fat, then you know the calorie part is taken care of. And if your heck and schmeck is in check, you know the hormone part is taken care of. And what you want to do is that is a very elusive place to get. So that might be keto plus a little bit of starch, right? Or that might be keto with a little bit more protein, which would be more primal. Or that might be like a strict keto diet where you can't go above 30 grams of carbohydrate, but you tweak it a little bit. You start to learn what keeps my heck of schmeck in check and what begins to um, reduce my body fat. Now, here's the thing, the other nasty thing, the other thing that the metabolism does when you learn how to speak metabolism. One of the things you'll learn about speaking metabolism is the, the metabolism never stays the same for long. It just does not do that. It's not a linear, predictable thing. So once you get in this nice place of losing fat and heck and schmeck and check, it's not going to stay that way. And so what ends up happening is you might ride that out for a week, two weeks, if you're lucky, three months, but eventually that's going to stop. You're going to sort of plateau. One of, one of two things is going to happen, or maybe both. You're either going to plateau and or your heck and schmeck is going to go out of check. And at that point in time, you start the process over again, right? So if we're doing this thing with Shane, let's say we start Shane first out on a keto diet because he loves that. He does some tweaking. That's his structure. He, does, he gets flexible with it and finds that he needs to add a little bit more protein. So now he's more like in a primal type of diet, right? And then over time, he realizes that he needs uh, extra. He really feels lighter and feels better. You know, he, he's got constipation maybe if he's eating too much fat and protein. So he adds in a bunch of vegetables and and. Uh, maybe adds in a little bit of starch at his final meal to help him with sleep. And next thing you know, we started with keto. We went to primal. Next thing we know, we have this keto slash primal slash Shane diet. And so this is the way Shane finds his diet for Shane right now in this, this point in time. Now, let's say you're a female, right? Because women tend to struggle with this a little bit more. And, you know, month to month, 
you go through these hormonal fluctuations. So you might have a diet that works for you in the first part of your menstrual cycle that is not the best diet for you in the second part. You get pregnant, hormones change, menopause, andropause for men, hormones change, stress, illness, hormones change. And so the idea, I think that what we're trying to teach here, Shane, is this idea that start with structure, be flexible, learn how to speak metabolism, and you'll eventually end up at the perfect diet for you. But then the process never ends. It's like learning a language or an instrument or anything that you master. You're constantly working this process. Now, in the beginning, it's a pain in the ass, right? Because you have to kind of like, this is all new to me, but easy is earned. And what I mean by easy is earned is that pretty soon, this becomes so second nature to you that you don't even really realize what you're doing, right? And then people are asking you, how do you stay fit and healthy and always seem to be right where you want. You have to kind of go back and try to remember, oh yeah, I remember this time where I learned this structure flexibility and I learned to you know, um, use calorie counting when I needed and use intuitive eating when I needed. And I, would, I, I know this process now that is a repeatable process. The interesting thing is our, what we typically want is prescriptions. Prescriptions only work for a limited time if they work at all. However, a process that you learn, like me and Shane are talking about right now, is something that you can repeat over and over and over again forever when everything's get out of whack. So you never actually have to find another diet again. You just have to work this process again. And this is how this works for the people who've mastered this. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great point. I think you made a, you touched on a really important topic and i remember this is how i started is i wanted something that was going to fix whatever i wanted it to fix versus learning that you know whatever diet you choose is sort of an introduction into understanding different types of foods and then adjusting it and in the point you made about you know us that have been in this industry or or maybe we've just been dieting for a really long time and trying to find the answers who have made a profession out of it a lot of the things that we do to adjust our food intake to then you know, affect heck and schmeck, oftentimes are second nature. They're like, oh, it's like, I, you know, I noticed that my lifts today during, you know, my bench press were like really terrible. Okay, well, what did I eat the night before? Well, I had absolutely no carbohydrates. So I probably have no glycogen stores, which means, you know, my lifts are probably suboptimal. So, but we do that in second nature. It's, it's another thing to have to learn that. And, and a lot of times that's why I recommend people get coaching because it's not going to just, unless you're doing a lot of trial and error and, and kind of researching, it's not something you just start to understand. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting, right? Cause uh, I agree with you. It's like, um, sometimes you do need the benefit of a coach is someone can say, this is the part, see this part over here. You're kind of missing because you can get lost in this process. You'll figure it out eventually if you stay with it, right? Um, but it might take three years instead of six months, right? Or, or a year. And I would say pretty much in order to go through this process, if you really focus on it, you know, it probably took me 10 years, you know, of just, you know, all the, because largely because I was stuck in my bias and dogma for a long time with particular eating regimes and wouldn't, wouldn't allow myself to just let my metabolism tell me what worked. So that was a big piece of it. But I would say my guess is if you're brand new to this and you get a coach, you know, um, someone to walk you through this process, um, it's going to take you about a year uh, uh, to, to, to really begin to learn um, this process. And this is another thing. Your metabolism doesn't care if you think that's a long time. It just doesn't give a damn. And, and that's the other thing that people need to understand. It's like they're this, you, know, you, you wake up and you're just like, I feel fat. I need to go on a diet. Your metabolism is like, I don't care what you feel in, emotionally in your head. You're either going to learn to work with me or not. And I'll make your life miserable if you don't. And that's partly what's going on here. So I, I usually say, if you're going to be patient, you know, and the fastest it's going to go to learn this and really start to master this, it's going to be about a year for most people in my mind. And it makes sense. Think about it, getting a master's degree or something like that. That's really what we're, what we're doing. You know, um, we're really taking people to metabolism school in a sense. And, and here's the big mistake they make. I've written books. Shane teaches. I have my own biases still. Shane has his biases. We have things we teach. Some of them overlap. Some of them don't, right? And what you, one of the mistakes people make is coming to Shane or me or their favorite guru or their favorite podcast or their favorite, favorite YouTube channel or all these things and trying to outsource learning their metabolism to other people. And what I would say is, 
do that, but you have to approach it the way Bruce Lee approaches it. I have this phrase that I always teach that I love that Bruce Lee said, he goes, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. So essentially what you're doing is when you're listening to Shane coach you, you're like, ooh, I can use that piece. Oh, I've already tried that piece, I know that doesn't work. Or let me try that on and see if it works. So absorbing what is useful, discarding what is not, and then bringing what you already know works. Like if Shane tells you never have chocolate or never have wine, or I tell you that, and you know that that acts as a buffer food for you and actually helps you eat better, you're probably gonna need to keep that wine in. And you have to trust your own physiology and your own metabolism. So no one knows your metabolism as well as you do or should know. And if you don't, then certainly people like Shane and I can teach you how to read the metabolism and speak its language. But eventually, you need to stop outsourcing that job to other people. That's a big uh, piece of this puzzle. Well, that seems sort of like a vicious cycle, too. If you're constantly ignoring the signals from your body and your metabolism, you're only making it harder for yourself to eventually get the solution that you've been looking for the entire time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you alluded to something, right? You were talking about, uh, we've made this a very simple conversation, right? And here's another thing that I think people do. You started talking about, you know, um, glycogen tanks. And, you know, uh, I've been talking about hormones. Like, in a sense, we, our metabolism does have a fat stat. It does have a way to measure how much fat's on its body. Leptin does that. It also has a way to measure how much protein's on its body. The amino acid pool does that. It also has a way to measure how much carbohydrate is stored in the body. The, the glycogen storage in the liver and the muscle and insulin and glucagon tell you that a little bit. A lot of people get bogged down on trying to learn all these mechanisms, thinking they're finding the holy grail. Understand this, that these mechanisms are a mere drop in an ocean of stuff we don't know, right? And so as much as you want to get savvy and try to be like insulin this and leptin that and GLP this and GIP that, trust me, I've been doing this for a long time. And the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Um, and then you get, then you say, oh my God, all these you know, probiotics and bugs in our gut are having all these effects. How can I make sense of that? And we do get overly enamored sometimes with all the knowledge that we can have. But what I have learned is that very simply, you can decipher what's going on by simply getting in touch with heck and schmeck. And now we even have more objective biofeedback tools too, right? So it's really those things, and, and I'll say it this way, I'll say it, uh, I'll, I'll kind of make it blunt so everyone can kind of understand me, and I really mean what I'm gonna say. If you're losing fat, if your heck and schmeck, your biofeedback sensations are in check, and if your vitals, blood sugars, blood fats, triglycerides, um, cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, all these things, if all those things are optimized, then I really don't care if you're eating nothing but fast food all day, every day. And the reason why I don't care is because your metabolism is telling you that's what's healthy. Now, I phrase it that way because I think all of us listening can be like, come on, Jay, don't be ridiculous. That's probably not going to create fat loss plus heck and schmeck plus optimal vitals. But my point in, in making it that phrasing the way I did is to get you to understand that, honestly, that there is no rule for this, except one rule, do what works for you. That's it. And it's a very, very important aspect of this. I doubt, and we all would doubt that anyone's gonna get those results by eating fast food. But the point remains, you do what works for you. And once you start doing that, it starts to allay a lot of the confusion that's out there. Because let's face it, it's getting more and more and more confusing as more and more and more voices come in. And so if you weren't confused before, you're going to be, you're likely going to be. And hopefully this model is much more simple for you. Just listen to your physiology, measure your progress, and make sure that your optimals and your vitals and all those things are, are heading in the right direction. Yeah, I have to say that until I came across your, your methods and your philosophy, I was just like everyone else, even as a professional, very confused because, you know, you had this keto expert, you had this vegan expert, you had everyone saying that their method was the best. And like you mentioned, you try it out for a while, it works really well, and then eventually it doesn't work as well, or it potentially doesn't work as well. And you start to second guess that person's, you know, approach. And then you go and you try something else instead of realizing that, at different times, different methods might be appropriate. Less protein here at certain times, more fats here at certain times. It's all about 
And I think that you're right when you, when you said that that sort of constant change and in, in some level of ambiguity is, is not reassuring to people because they want sort of a, what needs to fix me? And it's like, it's going to change from time to time, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, our human brains are, you know, uh, I'm a big psychology geek, so we want certainty and status are, are big ones, you know, so we want, we want people to like us, status, and we want certainty, right? We want to be like, tell me what to do. This is why food plans and recipes and all this stuff, you know, shopping lists and all that is so appealing to us. But again, you can't outsource to someone. And actually, my whole thing is when you have like, you know, Keto Kyle, that's a name I just made up. This guy that t says keto's the only way, it's the, the way that works, it's the only way that works. That's great for Keto Kyle. Keto works for Kyle, but, but he doesn't realize that it may or may not work for you. And I'll tell you, based on my clinical experience, this is typically how it works. You give any plan, I don't care what it is, 25% of the people it's gonna work for, 50% are gonna relatively remain neutral or not even do it. And then 25% are gonna be made worse from it, right? Um, and then there's all kinds of grays in between. Like for example, I love a keto diet. I never lose weight on it. I like it because it helps me think more clearly. It helps me feel more focused. It does some brain things. I never lose weight on a keto diet. I do it sometimes because I like to keep my metabolism flexible and I like the way it makes my brain feel, right? And so this is a really important aspect of this. Sometimes it's not just about looking good. Sometimes it's about feeling better, right? For example, I have, I have a thyroid. And actually, I, uh, I'll get into this a little bit because this will drive this home. I suffer from hypothyroid. I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune condition. Sometimes it's active, sometimes it's not, depending on how good I'm being with my diet and doing. Because sometimes you, I might know what I need to do for Jade. I might not always do it. This is a whole other sort of discussion to have, right? But this will drive it home about how hormones, how you have to listen to your hormones. So I've got a friend, my best friend and business partner, Gary Lee. Gary is, what, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, he's about 190 pounds. I'm 5'10", 225. I'm a big, big dude. I hold, uh, you know, I hold a lot of muscle and I hold a lot of fat too. So I'm kind of like, you know, I tend to gain fat and muscle really easily. I'm, what, what is that? I'm basically 30 pounds more than Gary and two inches taller than Gary. Gary can eat 3,000, 4,000 calories easily in a day and not gain any weight. If I go above 2,500 calories, I start turning into a cow. And you might say, well, Jade, I'm a, I'm, you know, some women even say, are you kidding me? I eat more than that. And I'm like, I know, and I wish it wasn't the case, but the bottom line is this is what it means for me, uh, and I have figured that out. And so there's this other idea that we need to discuss where people go, well, there's certain calories that, like, you know, you might say, well, eat this amount of calories or go online and do a total daily energy expenditure calculator. And you get that number. And because we love certainty, we automatically think, oh, that's my exact number. And that's the thing. No, it's not. The only thing that will tell you your exact number is your metabolism. So my metabolism has told me over time, Jay, you go above 2,500 calories, you're not losing any fat at all. You get below about 2,000, we'll start releasing some fat. You get below 1,700, Jade, we're going to make you crave things like crazy, and you're going to get even fatter. So I have to stay in this very narrow sort of range that I've figured out, largely because the thyroid's involved. Now, this goes back to your initial question, right, where you're kind of like, well, what is it, hormones or calories? It's both. If, if my thyroid isn't functioning appropriately, it's going to adjust my calories, right? And if I push calories up, it's going to adjust uh, my hormones. And this is the game that we must play. But think the reason I went through that discussion is because think about that. If you don't know that and you're trying to be like, go find someone's hypothyroid diet and follow it, that is not the thing that is going to free you from the struggles of weight loss with hypothyroid. The only thing that's going to free you is going through this process that I'm talking about. No one's hypothyroid diet. It might teach you some of the things that you need, right? Like um, Shane and I were talking about, it might give you some of the puzzle pieces but you cannot outsource it completely. You do it to learn. It's kind of like if you want to become a great piano player, right? You can't just play chopsticks all day, every day. And this is what people try to do. They're like, I want to lose weight, so I'm going to play chopsticks all day, every day. I'm going to follow the same diet all day, every day, the same one the, the keto guy did or the same one the vegetarian girl did, not realizing that 
if you really want to get good at this game, you got to graduate to Mary Had a Little Lamb and then Beethoven and then Bach. And eventually you're going to be playing like, you know, uh, really nicely on the piano. But that takes years to do. And so, yes, hormones matter. Yes, things like hypothyroid impact calories and stuff like that. And most importantly, you need to do the work to figure out um, how that's going to work for you. And we've kind of outlined some of those steps that you can use. Yeah, I really like that analogy. The one that I typically use is when, when you're learning an instrument, you learn how to play certain songs, right? But eventually, if you come up with your own songs, that's how you make you know, money as a professional, or that's how you start to show your own unique kind of twist on things, you know, whether it's a cover or whatever. So I really like that. And I'm, I'm glad that my next question actually was, you know, how, you know, do people, which I think you already answered, do people with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's have a harder time losing weight? So I think we pretty much already established that. But what are some of the things that uh, somebody like, what is a good first step for somebody who has, you know, diagnosed Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism to start? Is it, is it simply just playing with different, uh, you know, food combinations? Uh, what would be your advice on that? Yeah, so to me, right, I always go like this. Uh, to me, I say, most people that I work with, and, and you could tell me if this is true of you too, Shane, it may or may not be, but most people I work with who come to me and they say, it's always the same thing. They're like, I've been doing everything right and I'm not getting results. And in my head, I don't always say this to them, but the, the, this is the truest statement. If you're not getting results, then you're not doing everything right, no matter what you think. And what you think you're doing right is you've outsourced the diet, you followed it to the, the, the T, and you think that's doing everything right because you placed your belief in someone else's, uh, you know, sort of dietary regime. So for me, I essentially go, look, we have to look at both of these things, calories and hormones. I like, do you know how much, how many calories you eat in a day? Do you know? Most of them don't. Most people have never, ever weighed and measured their stuff. Like for me, and I don't know about you, Shane, but for me, let's say you take, Shane takes me out to lunch at Chipotle and he gets the bowl for me sets it down for me and says, Jade, here's your lunch. Can you guess how many calories are in this? I would look and I'd see all that chopped up chicken and maybe the rice and black beans that he threw in there and some peppers and everything else. And I guarantee you, I would get pretty close to knowing how many calories are in that big Chipotle bowl. Oh, he threw some guacamole on there and some cheese. All right, we're getting up to this is a 1,000, 1,200 calorie meal that I have now. How do I know that? I know that because I've spent countless hours in my kitchen weighing out what eight ounces of chicken breast looks like. I've, I've spent countless hours on, on my fitness pal or some other thing, typing stuff in and seeing, oh, I know, for example, that a donut is 250 calories to 300 calories and a chicken breast is about 250 to 300 calories, right? I know that. By the way, that distinction of donut and a chicken breast tells you everything you need to know about calories and hormones, right? They, they basically have the same amount of calories but we know we can eat five donuts. Very few people are going to eat five chicken breasts. And that's because of what these things do to hunger and cravings. But I can look at that bowl at Chipotle and relatively quickly tell you a good estimate of calories because I earned that over time weighing and measuring. So you get all these people that come to you. And if you're one of these people listening, just hear me out here. If you've never done that, if you don't actually know what eight ounces of protein looks like and how many calories that is, or you don't know what a cup of starch looks like and how many calories that is, or you don't know what, you know, sort of uh, two handfuls of broccoli looks like and what that is, how many calories that is, you are not really in a position to say whether something's working or not. So the, your, your question was, what do I do first? First, I make sure that everyone understands what they are actually eating and are aware of the things that are going in their mouths on a numbers level if they haven't done that before, right? Second, I start to say, what about, so now let's say we have those calories, let's say, and then I say, now what about these calories makes you full and satisfied and without cravings and sleeping well, right? That's where we start to adjust the macronutrients. So to me, it's first, let's get aware of how many calories you need. And by the way, if you were going to ask me, okay, Jade, give me the starting place, give me the, the structure. I would say, go out to a total daily energy expenditure calculator online punch in your numbers there. It's an estimate, by the way. It's not exact, but get that estimate. Then go through just three days, four days, maybe a week and track every damn thing you're eating and see the difference between those two. And if there's a really wide gap between what you're taking in and your estimated total, total daily energy expenditure, you have a very big clue of what might, might be going on. Now, neither of those things are going to be completely 
accurate because that TDEE is not completely accurate. And obviously, you're probably going to miss a tablespoon of peanut butter here or there when you track your food. But they're going to be relatively uh, a good indication of what's happening. And at that point in time, then you need to narrow that gap, right? Because it's that calorie gap in intake and output that creates the stress that causes the starvation response that causes hunger and cravings and all that kind of stuff. And so at that point, once you have that total daily energy expenditure number and you know exactly how you're, what you're eating per day and you try to narrow that, then you have to say, okay, based on what I'm eating, how can I change the quality of what I'm eating? Because that was a quantity, that was a quantity uh, exercise we just did. But then you go and say, what, what can I do with the quality of the foods that I'm eating to basically make it so that my hunger, energy, craving, sleep, mood, heck and schmeck are in check. And now you have a really good starting place. This is what I would typically do. Now, if you're someone who just goes, I don't want to count anything, then, I, then here's the intuitive starting place I use. I say, okay, I'm going to give you a starting diet that is calorie sparse, that is nutrient dense, and that will, in my mind, for most people, cause hunger suppression. And that diet looks just like this. Soups, salads, scrambles, shakes, and stir fries. More directly, low carb, low fat, soups, salads, scrambles, shakes, and stir fries. Why low carb, low fat? Not because I hate carbs or fat. You got to have them. It's not because they're unhealthy. I'm not even talking about that. I'm saying low fat, low carb, soups, salads, scrambles, shakes, and stir fries because I want the calories as low as possible to start so that you know these are the 90% of what you're eating. And now from there, if you want to be intuitive, add enough, but not too much of starch, sugar, salt, fat, and alcohol, because the, the calorie load is going to come almost always from starch and fat. Again, go back to the chicken breast and the donut. You can eat five donuts pretty easily. Some people can do that for breakfast. Very few people are going to be able to eat five chicken breasts, even in a day, and they're the same amount of calories. And so whenever you put starch and fat together, that's where the calorie load comes. That's where the highly palatable, high, highly palatable hedonistic pinging in the brain happens. That's usually what causes you to overeat. So to me, it's chicken and broccoli, basically, which is another way of saying soup, salad, scramble, shakes, and stir fries. Chicken and broccoli, chicken and broccoli, chicken and greens, steak and greens, fish and greens, right? And then enough but not too much of these other things. Now you're eating intuitively. Are you getting the results or not? If you're not, you got to go back to the calorie counting equation. If you are, don't worry about it. And this is how you merge these two. So no matter where we start, one way I said, get your TDEE, measure all your food. If you don't get results, by the way, or, you ha or you're not able to do this without getting intuitive, you may need to go back to the intuitive response or intuitive approach. If you want to be intuitive, soup, salad, scramble, shakes, and stir fries, 90% of your food that way, enough but not too much, starch, fat, salt, sugar, and alcohol, and then see if you get the results. And if you get, don't get the results, then you're not doing everything right. Then you have to go back and start counting calories. And this is the game you play back and forth on the seesaw. Maybe you're counting calories one minute. Maybe you're intuitive the next. Quality, quantity. They're not separate. They are synergists. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I think it made a ton of sense. And you, you do a really good job of simplifying that because that is, it can be a very, you know, complicated process. And I really like your idea between, you know, the, the soups and all the other S uh, words. That, uh, was it soups, salads, scrambles, stir fries? Shakes and stir fries. Shirt, shirt, shakes and stir fries, right. If you, guys, if you want a, a really interesting way to think about this, think about a soup. A low starch, low fat soup is just a wet salad. A right. salad is a salad. A stir fry is a hot salad. Right? right. Scramble is an egg salad. Right. And then you have protein shakes. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Because you're starting with a, a base of vegetables and protein, and then you're adding in the more starch based carbs and the, you know, the higher fat foods. And you're right. That's where the calories are going to add up for 90% of people. Yeah. Think about it. Right. If we were all, if everyone listening right now, me, me and Shane and all of you got thrown out somewhere in the wild, right, where we had to fend for ourselves, it's very, very difficult to even consume 2,000 calories unless we kill a big animal in the fall, specifically, that has a lot of fat on their body. Because most of the time, most of the year, those animals are going to be pretty damn lean. It's basically like eating chicken. If you ever had venison or elk or any of these animals, they are very lean, even bare, unless you get it and eat it at a particular time of year, right? So, you know, 
basically what we evolved on is chicken and broccoli. So people are like, can you simplify it even more? Yes, I will simplify it even more. Chicken and broccoli is the base diet, lean protein, lots of vegetables. That is basically the diet. However, that is not very, that's satiating, hunger suppressing like crazy. It's not very satisfying. So you want to then take to that chicken and broccoli or chicken and greens or steak and broccoli or steak and greens. And you want to add to that, um, you want to add to that this, these you know, nice flavor enhancers, right? Now, if you're a vegetarian listening to this or a vegan listening to this and you're getting mad at me because you're like, well, I'm a vegetarian and vegan, you can do this too. Here's the way you do it, right? So when you can do the same thing, soups, salads, scramble shakes, and stir fries, you just want to do extra vegetables. What oftentimes vegans and vegetarians do is they're not really vegans and vegetarians. I know meat eaters who eat more vegetables than most vegans and vegetarians do. Most vegans and vegetarians are starchitarians and starchins, not vegetarians and vegans. And so all you need to do if you're a vegetarian or a vegan is make sure you're eating most of the bulk of your food in terms of these soup, salad, scramble shakes, and stir fries. Again, low starch, low fat, soup, salad, scramble shakes, and stir fries. Whereas Shane and I, who maybe eat meat, I don't know if you do, Shane, but we might have chicken on ours. You won't, right? But you're still going to be getting that fiber thing. So one of, one of the things that we're talking here is protein, fiber, and water, which is basically chicken and broccoli, are one of the best things to satiate most people. Now, there is some individual variation here. Maybe fat is a little bit more satiating to Shane than it is to me. Maybe starch is a little bit more satiating for you than it is to us. But in general, protein, fiber, and water. And so if you understand this, whether you're a vegan, a vegetarian, a meat eater, a paleo person, a keto person, or whatever, you can begin this process. Awesome. Now, I got, I, we only have about five more minutes in the hour. I don't want to take too much of your time. So this might be too big a topic to, to settle in five minutes. But I'm curious, let's say somebody is doing all the right things nutrition-wise. They're, they're listening to their heck and schmeck and they're, they're following all of that. When do medications for somebody with, a, with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's take place? Or can they be ever eliminated? Does someone have to be on medications their entire life if they have this condition? Well, it's a, you know, I'm the perfect person to talk about uh, here because I have certainly been off my medications for to at times and, um, and have felt fine. But uh, right now and over the last five years, I've just essentially decided I don't want to be without them. And here's the reason why. You can kind of think of it like this in my mind. Um, when you think about sort of your metabolic engine, right, you kind of think of the brain hypothalamus. Think of a big jumbo jet airplane. And the brain, the hypothalamus, is basically the, the, the pilot, the cockpit, right? But the thing that's driving the engine are these two big engines, right? Or the thing that's flying a plane are these two big engines on either wing. When I think about those, I think about the adrenal glands and I think about the thyroid gland. These, these two big engines here. And so imagine one gets weak, right? For whatever, stress reactions, whatever. For me, it was medical school. Um, it was constant bartending and personal training while going full-time to medical school and just grind, 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 and trying to train and trying to be a vegetarian all at the same time. And I was on the wrong diet for me, the wrong lifestyle for me, like it just blew, blew up one of my engines. And what happened was, is now what happens is life is pretty stressful. I'm an entrepreneur, I do lots of things. And so yes, if life was perfect, maybe I could use ashwagandha and a really clean diet and maintain my thyroid. I have just found that when I'm not on it, I don't feel at my best. And to me, we have to get over again this bias of like using natural things like it is natural to take thyroid hormone and so for me for most of my patients i would never want them off their thyroid because being without thyroid is too risky in so many ways however if you're someone that that uh, you certainly can especially with hashimoto's it's interesting if you're someone with hashimoto's um i have revert i have easily reversed hashimoto's in uh, and this is a bad word you know in the medical field but those of us who do this work, uh, we can get rid of Hashimoto's. We can make those, in, those uh, antibodies essentially disappear um, and correct those numbers naturally. And if you maintain that diet, you're someone who can you know, eliminate some of these things. For example, let's say you have a hidden gluten intolerance, which is fairly common with people with Hashimoto's, and we remove gluten. Some of these people's thyroid restores. I've certainly had people who are using glandulars or things like ashwagandha, which is an adaptogen. It's really good for the adrenal and thyroid. I just would not uh, make that recommendation across the board. Like you're going to, if you're someone who's dealing with this and you're trying to come off your thyroid medications, 
uh, that's going to make things way more difficult for you. So what I would say is here's how to do this, by the way. We already went through this. Let's say you're someone who's dealing with thyroid issues. You're on thyroid medications now. Clean up everything first, right? Get the diet correct. Start losing fat. Start optimizing everything, right? And what you will find is that at first, maybe you're heck and schmeck or out of check and you're fatigued and you take thyroid meds and it makes you feel better. And as your metabolism starts to heal, and your own thyroid starts picking back up its own production, then you'll start feeling a little wired on the inside, almost like you got too much thyroid. And this is how I've taken people off thyroid meds before. I'm like, oh, interesting, your thyroid numbers are up. We need to decrease your medication. We decrease it a little bit. Then we decrease it a little bit. And we're like, we, I think we can go without it now. And that has certainly happened. It's just not the norm, and it's not something I think people should ever do without a functional medicine person or a conventional doctor who's managing those medications. But yes, it can happen. It's not the norm, nor would it be something I recommend that anyone do unless they get optimize your health first. Like it's a really weird thing that we humans want to do. We're like, we want to optimize our health and just take away the medications first. No, you have to earn that and then you could take it away. I'm really glad you said that because that's sort of been what what I've learned through just my own research is that it's like, oh, we have to get off the medications. You don't want to be relying on medications. It's like, okay, yeah, if you're taking like 60 you know, medications, maybe it's like, okay, you're just kind of using it as a Band-Aid for not cleaning up your metabolism. But you're right. You know, if it helps you optimize everything else and you're doing everything that you have the most control over, nutrition, exercise, sleep, you know, stress, things like that, then, then yeah, absolutely. There's, just, there's nothing to be, there's no reason to feel bad for you know, staying on those medications. And one thing I'll say before we end this, and I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but one thing we have to say for everyone listening here is that notice how Shane and I are talking nutrition, 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 nutrition. Now, I know a lot of you are wondering, well, aren't you guys fitness dudes? Yes, we are. But here's the interesting thing about this. Exercise is one of these things that easily throws heck and schmeck out of check. As a matter of fact, the research tells us pretty conclusively in my mind from reading of the research is that 25% of people will respond to exercise in the way that they think. In other words, if you go, you know, and they'll lose weight, and they'll, they'll be able to do exercise and it works for them. 50% of those 100% end up having compensations enough with exercise that their hunger goes up. There's this really weird thing that you have to understand. You don't want a fast metabolism. You want a flexible metabolism. Anytime you need to speed, you try to speed up your metabolism, you're also speeding up hunger. Well, exercise can do that. And 25% of individuals actually overcompensate with exercise so much so that they may actually gain weight on it, especially when it comes to cardio. So 25%, and by the way, I'm referring to a, a study on peri, uh, postmenopausal women here that actually showed this. They did nothing else but change exercise and kept their diet the same. 25% lost weight, as you would expect, with an energy decrease. 50%, nothing changed because they compensated in eating. 25% gained weight as a result of being put on an exercise program because they overate. And so the rule here is never use exercise to try to drive fat loss. Always try to manage your calories with a food first and then make sure you do the kind of exercise that assures that you're losing mostly fat. For example, uh, weight training becomes the dominant form of activity, just like protein becomes the dominant protein and fiber become the dominant things to control hunger. And then you add enough of the things you like, right? So just like we talked about soup, salad, scramble shakes, and stir fries with enough of that other stuff. When it comes to exercise, stick with walking and weight training and then add enough of all the other stuff you love. If you love yoga, do a little bit of that. If you love jogging, do a little bit of that. But sometimes the thing we love is not the thing that will get us results. And again, this goes back to the metabolism, not giving a damn that you love to run, right? So make sure that when you're thinking about exercise, you are not using it as the thing to try to drive fat loss because it will, it will start throwing that, that seesaw all over the place for a lot of people. Use nutrition to make the adjustments when you're playing this game. I'm extremely glad that you said that because I get so much shit for saying exactly the same thing that you just said from, you know, from the marathon runner to whoever, you know, wants to talk about it. But it's like, yeah, that I literally only prescribe when it comes to exercise, weightlifting and walking as a, as a base. And then, like you said, throwing in, it's kind of like, you know, like, you have your, your base of your protein veggies. And then if you want a little bit more carbs, like you mentioned earlier, you throw that into kind of, you know, it's, it's more, that's more like the 20% versus the 80% of what you should be prioritizing. Absolutely. 
And, and I think the final thing here to just kind of understand when it comes to exercise, understand again, just like, you know, your friend who's the runner who looks super lean and you're like, well, she runs and she looks great. Trust me, she chose running because she was good at running. Or, you know, so in a sense, running chose her. It's just like football chose me. At my genetics, I'm a football dude. You know what I mean? I, I'm not, you're not going to see me out there running a marathon. Now, if I did that, I might move a little bit in that direction, but I'm still going to be a rhinoceros running a marathon. I'm never going to be a gazelle <laughs> running a, a, a marathon. And so we have to understand that we're, we're all sort of different. So that runner who you see is very lean. Trust me, she was probably lean and geared towards running before she ever started running and running fit her. And so the idea is do the things that work, walking and weight training, and then add in the things you love as needed. Not too much, though, to throw you off. You know, so it's just an important distinction. What works for your girlfriend or your bro is not necessarily going to work for you. And actually, it rarely does. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good place to end there, uh, Jade. Uh, before we go, though, where can people find more uh, information about you? Yeah, I mean, uh, Instagram is the place we're all hanging out right now for the time being. So I always tell people, check me out there at Jade Tita on Instagram. And then jadetita.com is my website. I will answer DMs. Uh, just, just give me a, give me a sec because it can take, it can take several weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, awesome. I, do, I do try to make it a, a, a point, though, to get my, a staff member or myself to answer those. So definitely hit me up there and follow me on Instagram. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton. This was the best podcast I think I've had so far. So I really appreciate your time and, and all of your information and, and uh, just everything you put into this. Shane, I so appreciate your work, man. I'm honored to, honored to be here. So thank you so much. Awesome. Absolutely.